everywhere we go, people want to know who we are and where we come from. So who are you and where do you come from? Hi, you're Rebecca. Um, I'm Kim Hall and I come from Ballymun. Kim, I, you came to my attention on your Instagram page when you put a video out and I was looking at it and I could see how heartbroken you were because, and again, I'm not, we're not going to get into that. We've had a little discussion about that. We're not going to get into that, but it was more for me that the amount of effort that you put in and you're so invested in your walk and talk. But before we start talking about the walk and talk, I want to talk about you from your earlier life and what has taken you to the person that you are today. So from the start, what was it like growing up in Ballymun? Um, growing up in Ballymun was, for me, I think I had an amazing childhood. Um, like, obviously, from a young age, um, as far as I can remember, there was certain aspects of my life um, that wouldn't have been, what would you say, um, you know, your typical childhood. There was certain aspects of trauma um, my mother had um, depressed depression, so I can remember a lot from a very early age. Um, but like that, growing up in Ballymun, I always felt a sense of community. Um, I always felt, you know, that if there was something wrong, that a neighbour would give a dig out, or you know, you needed a spoonful of sugar or something, you could knock into a neighbour. Um, I have very early memories of playing on my grandmother's street on her road where I still live now um, you know even when the snow was there we'd go up and down on sleds um, just Ballymun in itself um, I always felt like I always felt a sense of community um, safe some yeah I felt safe don't it's home Ballymun is home I do feel safe in home yeah um, I do feel safe in Ballymun it's home um, don't, don't get me wrong, there was experiences um, where at a very young age, with me, myself and a good friend of mine, we would have seen, you know, um, people that were addicted to drugs, taking drugs, we would have seen stuff like that going on um, in the flats where we lived. Um, we would have seen all sorts going on in the flats. But it's funny, even though we've seen these things, we still felt safe, we still felt sense of community and that, if you were to walk along the flats at night, let's say, or, you know, someone would always be looking out a window and you felt like someone was always watching over you, you know. Um, and probably because we lived in the flats in Coltry and my grandmother lived down in the houses in Coltry that I could always go down to my grandmother if I needed anything. And So, yeah, somewhat safe, yeah, even though there was stuff that you wouldn't probably call normal for a child mm. <laughs> to see. <laughs> And you said there that you would have seen like depression with your mother from a very young age. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and what you've seen and what it was like for you and like a young, little young mind experiencing that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do want to talk about it because basically I think that that's one of the main factors and why I have decided to do walk and talk um, was because at a young age, as far as I can remember, um, you know, my mum wasn't a bad mother. She had dinners on, she had us fed, she had us washed and dressed. And, you know, if we wanted things and she could afford at the time, we got it. But also she had this other side to her um, that she had and was diagnosed with postnatal depression. She was diagnosed with depression. Um, she would have had panic attacks, anxiety. Um, and she... I've never known her to be involved in drugs or drink. Um, she wasn't a drinker, as like a big drinker or anything like where you'd say, well, you know, she was drinking every weekend or she was drinking every day. It wasn't that. Um, it was her mind, you know. It was her mental health um, and maybe demons that she had in her own life and her own childhood that she was kind of grown as we were grown because she had me very young. She had me at 17. Oh, did she? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So... Um, no, I don't think, as a child, um, I didn't know no different, you know. So, to me, she was a loving mother. We still got the hugs, we got the kisses. She always told us she loved us. But like that, um, there was things we seen, like, she wouldn't, let's say, be able to bring you to a playground very often or every day or every second day. So, for me, if I've a spare, if I've spare time in between everything else in life with two small children... Um, our play, the playground is our number one stop. 
Um, but my mum could never get to the playground, you know. She'd get to the front door and um, the panic attacks would set in, the anxiety would set in, the self-doubt. Um, and then, you know, she'd probably in bed for some most days. Um, I keep saying she wasn't a bad mother because I felt like, you know, we never starved. We never, I never felt hungry mm. growing up. Um, I never felt that I wasn't, my needs weren't being fulfilled. Or maybe I just didn't know no different. Mm. And, you know, that's the thing where our mothers will never, no matter what we'll always say, we love our mothers, you know. Mm. But, well, I will anyways. I love my mum um, and I don't blame her for suffering from depression. And I think that's why people say that's why you are so empathetic and that's why you are the way you are. And So I don't blame her, mm. basically, for having mental health problems. And how many of us were in the house? Uh, there was myself and my two younger sisters, but my youngest sister was then, um, she was fostered as, fostered as a child because um, my mum got postnatal depression on her quite severe when she was pregnant. So at that stage, she would have been in a psychiatric hospital um, after she had her. And so she was fostered into the family. Okay. And um, you're telling me that your grandmother was that whole mother? My mum's mother, yeah. 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 And did, she, like, did they see it? Like it, years ago, people didn't see depression. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, so basically, my mum's mother would have suffered herself as well. Um, my grandfather would have been an alcoholic. So he was a good man as well. Like that. When I say an alcoholic, it's like... They managed things very well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So, like your the the house was always fine. There was food on the table, but like that they had their own demons. So, my granddad used to go drinking in the towers, which was a local pub in Ballymun, mm-hmm. um, and he was an alcoholic. And then, so my nanny would have had five children, and basically she was the woman that was at home and holding everything together. And then, obviously, that had an impact on her and. She suffered then with our nerves and with depression and anxiety attacks, panic attacks. and um, but, but I look at my grandmother in admiration and I think to myself, oh my God, like for you to rear five children on your own and then to have to try and keep somebody that has an addiction together as well and try to keep the family together. I just look at somebody like that for, with pure admiration and think they're so strong. Like I would never ever judge them for having a mental illness or say, well, like you know, you were in depressed, you were depressed, or you were in bed, and you couldn't cope, and you couldn't do this. I see the other side, and think, wow, how strong were you to try and keep everything together on your own and deal with all of this as a human? Like, I just feel for you now. Like, I mean, I'm going to jump forward, but I'll go back. Yeah. That you wanted to break the chain, did you? Did you have that? Like, I, I need to break the cycle. Yeah. So, uh, it's funny that you say that actually, because obviously. With my grandmother, my mother, and then the stuff that I have experienced in my childhood and the trauma, um, I've always had this immense amount of self awareness. So then I always said, "There's no way, even though I have empathy for them, there's no way in hell I'm going to be that person for my children. I'm not going to like. Obviously, I'm not saying judging anyone. Like we all have bad days. You know, you have a bad day. We're human. We're not robots. But I'm not going to be that person. That's not going to." be able to get out of the bed and I'm not saying that you can control that but I'm just going to fight with all my might to try and look after my mind my mental health and to try and you know deal with that trauma and heal like I use that word heal a lot um so going off the subject sorry but that is getting back to what you said to me um I actually done a bit of therapy with a really nice guy and he said to me you know, you're going to, you're breaking the cycle. You're going to be the one that's going to break the cycle. You're not going to continue that generation, generational cycle of mental health in your family and to allow it kind of take hold, you're going to break the cycle. I <laughs> so it. I you hope I am. Yeah, no, I can see it. And, um, and tell me earlier on before we spoke, uh, we spoke off, Mike, you said that you moved around a bit. Did you move around? Yeah. And why did you move around? Um, so basically, um, Going from the youngest early childhood, um, so the earliest memory I can remember when I was two, I was placed in a care home. Okay. Um, I don't remember much about the care home, um, but the only reason how I remember it is because there was trauma there. Uh, one incident, we they brought us. It was like a day trip out. They brought us out, and um, they, which is actually quite funny now, but 
they put me into the water. So two ladies, I can't remember who they are, um, names or nothing, and I don't want to either, but they basically swung me into the sea and I got this overwhelming feeling like I was drowning. Um, so for a long time, I was actually afraid of the bath. <laughs> Mm. I'm not now I wash myself <laughs> but um yeah so that's one of the earliest memories I have is being in a care home and then obviously when my mother would have been in and out of hospital uh, in and out of psychiatric hospitals I would have stayed in my grandmother's um and I would have stayed around with relatives um and then when um all of that kind of came to would you say a halt for me Oh, it, it became actually, sorry, more of a parent was when my mother died by suicide. Um, I moved around then a lot after that. So I was very unsettled and basically looking for a home. <laughs> so tell me about your mum. She was in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Yeah. And how long would that spell go for? And how long, when would she be out? And tell me about it. Um, so when we were younger... Um, I would have blocked a lot of it out. So, but when we were younger, there wouldn't have been long spells. Because I'd say she would have had a sense of awareness as well that she had to get home to her children. You know, mm-hmm. as I said, I she wasn't a bad mother. Like you know, she wasn't. She she always told us she loved us and stuff. So I can't remember really long spells when I was a child, uh, when I was a younger child. But when I got into my teens, um, the depression started to really take hold, and it was it was getting really bad. Um, I was 15 and I started walking part-time while I was in school. So I noticed it getting really bad at that stage. Um, I don't know whether it was that um, maybe she felt like she... Because she had put so much into her children and so much into trying to look after herself that she probably thought by me getting this job that I was, you know, fleeing the nest and maybe a sense of even more loss and... You know, she didn't know what to be doing with herself. So I noticed she started to spiral then even more. So at that stage, the hospital admissions would have been a bit longer. So at one stage, she would have been in for about eight or nine months. Okay. Yeah. And where are you? Where's your, your sister? Because your sister, she stayed in foster, did she? My youngest in- sister was has always been with her family. That's her, her biological family. Mm-hmm. Her dad's side. So mm-hmm. she would have stayed. They basically had her full time. So they cared for her full time. So... She was obviously not okay. Obviously, she's dealing with her own stuff, but mm. in that sense, she was safe. Mm. Um, my younger sister then, we have um, different fathers. So at those at those times and those spells, she would have stayed with her father. Um, and I then would have had to be either with my grandmother or with a relative. So one of an aunt, an aunt one of my mm. mom's sisters. Um, but like that, my grandmother wasn't well. And then I have an aunt who's Down syndrome. So for me to go to my grandmother's home, even though, like I love my nan to bits, like she's she was absolutely me rock, you know. But um, and she just passed away. It's actually her anniversary now, oh um, on Sorry. the twenty ninth. But like that, um, she still hadn't got the capacity to look after herself, so to speak. So I was a child, it's like a teenager, fourteen, fifteen years of age, gone into my grandmother's. But um. I was still like the adult, mm-hmm. you know. My aunt was Down syndrome. My grandmother had her own problems with mental health. So I was basically the responsible one. Okay. Yeah. What's that do to you? <laughs> um, it makes me feel a lot older than what I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm 32. I feel 50 sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't get me wrong. Like, I love having a laugh and trying to act my age as well but it's given me an overwhelming feeling of responsibility for a lot of people um so yeah probably missed out on certain aspects of my life as a child and stuff just that feeling of being looked after someone to mind me kind of thing so what it does overall for me i think is make makes me very very resilient and very strong i Mm -hmm. i feel um don't get me wrong (laughs) have me moments where I'm quite weak um, I'm not always strong but I've had to learn to be the strong one yeah sitting at you here I don't <laughs> think it's done you any harm <laughs> do you know I know you have but like sitting up but yeah we're going to talk about walk and talk as well yeah. um, so then tell me then your mum was in hospital and 
what happened to the stage where your mum passed away? Okay, so um, she was obviously depressed um, and she was in and out of hospital. I don't know if I'm able to say the hospital. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's... I, so it was basically St. Vincent's Hospital in Fairview. Um, but like that, um, she was in and out of there for over a number of years throughout our life. She was in and out of that hospital. I have memories from the hospital, not nice memories from the hospital at all. Um, in what way? So basically, when she was in having treatment, um, well, I thought she was having treatment and, you know, I thought that was the safe place to go. And at that stage, it was our last hope. That was the only kind of thing, place that, you know, she, she was going back and forth to try and seek help and treatment and support. So... She was there in St. Vincent's and I would have been 15 years of age. Um, so the main kind of caregiver, um, she would have smoked. So I would have had to visit, not that I would have had to, but obviously I wanted to visit my mm. mother. But I was the responsible person who had to go down and give her smokes and leave her money for, let's say she wanted some minerals, like some 7 up or whatever. Mm. Fresh pyjamas, fresh underwear. I was that person. Um, bear in mind, going to school and walking part time at the same time and then walking down I'll never forget that long road the Richmond road mm-hmm. oh stop like being 14 15 years of age and having to get a bus in the dark and all and looking back at it now you think oh my god mm-hmm. how brave were you when you were that age like mm-hmm. <laughs> you know because you, you ever realize when you're a child you when you're that age you're so resilient yeah. like you just you don't you, it's, sometimes yeah. you don't think yeah. you don't you know you, you just kind of keep going but um yeah so um one of a memory that I have that wasn't very nice was um, it was actually a doctor that was looking after my mother and she was in his care and he called me into a room it was like an office um, like a family room and he sat me down and he said to me um, you know we're here your mom's here a number of months now um, the treatments aren't really doing much for her they don't seem to be walking for her and um, basically let me know that they were going to be discharging her quite soon and that they felt that there was nothing that they could much do for her um, and he actually turned around and used the word attention seeking. He said to me, look, Kim, I believe your mom is attention seeking. Um, we've tried a number of different routes of treatment. Um, and we believe now that it's time for her to go home. The longer she stays in here, that she's not going to be able to adjust to coming back out into society and back into the home. Um, so, Like from, man up. Yeah. Isn't that disgusting? Yeah. And... So for me, even like as a 15, 14, 15 year old, I was 15 at the time. So for me as a 15 year old child, first of all, I felt a complete sense of hopelessness because I was sitting going, I'm 15 years of age. I'm not the adult here. What do I do? Should he even be saying stuff like this to me? And then when he said attention seeking, my whole soul just crushed. I just thought, oh my God, like to see somebody in such bad pain like because she was she was in pain and mm. that's what I say to people when they come to my group when they come to walk and ha- talk um I can feel the pain in people you know and as you said telling somebody that's in such so much pain to just man up mm. and not having any sort of understanding or empathy or compassion towards them it was just soul destroying it really was like I was absolutely heartbreaking um but they discharged her and um, when they discharged her then, they basically discharged her into my care as a 15-year-old child. So myself and, me, well, I probably wouldn't have been the person who signed for her. Maybe it would have yeah. been an aunt. But they knew that she was going home to just myself and herself in her flat. We lived in the flats in Ballymun. Um, so basically she was attention-seeking. They couldn't offer her any more help. Um, and then, so we went home to the flats in Ballymun and there was basically a number of attempts of suicide but like that I was still trying to be responsible and I don't know where I get this sense of get up and go no matter what's happening to me but I I don't know where it comes from but it's that just overwhelming sense to just right just come on Kim keep going just let's keep going and you know we'll muddle through this and we'll get through it and so obviously then I was still in school, so I was still going to school. 
I was working part time in a shop in Donamate. So I used to have to cross the road at the flats in Ballymun, get the 70 and A, the bus down to Donamate to work and then come back and care for my mother. But every time I left for work, it was horrible. I had a horrible feeling like, you know, like I was leaving someone vulnerable and a baby. But that shouldn't have been my responsibility. I was mm. only 15 years of age. Um, and so I never forget one night I was going to work in Donamade like that I would have walked because I was in school I would have done Thursday Friday late night and then Saturday Sunday to try and earn a few mm. bob you know my mum was a single mother as well in Ballymoon and um, like that because of her depression depression, she couldn't really hold she couldn't mm. hold down a job so I was trying to contribute to the house as well and you know just and trying to better myself I had like you know people always kind of encouraged me no matter what was going on you know keep going and do what you need to do when you're a young girl and you, you have all these ambitions to go to college and all. So I was just trying to hold it all together, so to speak. But um, I'll never forget one night I went um, to walk and it was a late night like that and I was coming back off the bus so I possibly could have finished about half eight, nine. Came back off the bus, um, the 70 and A, and got off across the road from the flats. And as you come off the bus and you're crossing the road to go through the field, you can look, you could look up now, the flats aren't there anymore, mm. obviously they're all knocked down in Ballymont, so you could look up and I could see my window, and it was always just a habit, you know, you'd look up and you'd see the window and you'd say to yourself, right, my mm. mum's there and I'm going to get home to my mum and make sure she's okay, and I remember one night I just got off the bus and I was walking across the field and I looked up, and when I looked up I just seen the whole window open flames, and I literally don't know how or what but I got myself and I ran so fast and bear in mind we were on the top floor the seventh floor and the flats um didn't even wait for the lift just literally sprinted up the stairs because I knew my mom was in that flat so I sprinted um don't know what came over me but I ran through the flat there was smoke everywhere and um when I ran through she was lying on the sofa in the sitting room just lying there with her eyes wide open just literally she was in so much pain she couldn't move and the place was in flames around her literally was in flames like there was fire everywhere and smoke everywhere and I honestly don't know where I got the strength but I just pulled her pulled her out of the flat and rang the fire brigade or a neighbour rang the fire brigade um, and even when the fire brigade came and the firemen and women came they were in disbelief like they couldn't believe what had gone on and I'd explained to them that, you know, they put her out of the hospital and they said she was attention-seeking and what am I to do? And But there was still no help after that for We then ended up just going down and staying with my grandmother's for the night. Coming Did back. your mum set the fire? Yeah. Yeah, she, so she, that, was an, that was an attempt. That was a suicide attempt. Yeah, so she basically wanted to do what she eventually done. And then you went to your nanny's? Yeah, so we would have went to my nanny's for the night, um, just to stay the night. And when I sit and talk about it now, I think, oh my God, did we actually go through that? Like, obviously I've been over this stuff in my head a number mm-hmm. of times. And, but when you're in it, you just do what you have to do to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, so we stayed at my nanny's and then probably the next day or a couple of days after that, we would have went back up, cleaned the flat and would have went back living in the flat again. Um did because you ever want to put your hands on her, Kim, and shake her? And yeah, um, there was times where, there was many a times where we would have had, you know, emotional, you know, disagreements, and I would have said to her, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, you've, you know, and at that stage, me being a child, and now knowing what I know about mental health and now having the understanding of what I do with mental health but at that stage I didn't um obviously I was going through it and but I was kind of saying I'm not blaming myself but I know now I was saying the wrong things not the wrong things but I couldn't understand Mm -hmm. her Mm. pain yeah but I was a child as well Mm. so I completely get it Mm. but like that yeah I would have said to her um you know, why are you doing this? You've got three young girls. We have a whole life ahead of us because I'm always, I, that's what I am. I, I'm an optimistic person. Mm. I try to see the positive and everything. Mm. I, try, I wake up in the morning, I think if I have a bad thought, flip that bad thought, practice mm. gratitude. Like I am, I try to be positive. I'm not saying 
I'm positive, Polly. Mm. Like, we mm. all have bad days and bad experiences. But to try and see the positive and take the good from bad all the time. So I would have said to her, like, look, you've three beautiful girls. We've our whole life ahead of us, you know. And she could never just get out of that mind frame. She always just would have went back to the past. Um, it's one thing I use as well in my group. I say it a lot as well. So at any given moment, your mind will jump from three. Uh, your mind will jump from either the past to the present to the future. You know, and this is why I practice mindfulness in my group to always try and bring yourself back to the present. You know, you cannot change the past and you have no control over the future. But for my mom, she could just never get out of that mindset of the past and stuff that had gone on in our life and our own traumas and our own demons. And she just allowed a consumer. But um, yeah, so I would have said to her, you know, why are you doing this? And I would have been very emotional. I would have cried, like, why are you hurting us? And there was times where she would have turned around and said, like, I don't love you and I don't want to be here anymore. But I know that that wasn't my mum. I know mm. that wasn't my mum, Rachel, that I love and that loved me. And I know that that was, you know, the mind frame that she got herself into, the mindset that she got herself into. And the illness, that's, that was that talk and it wasn't. So, but yeah, it would have got quite emotional. Definitely at times. Um and yeah you would have had a sense of just wake up but I don't have that sense anymore of saying to somebody that's suffering with mental health just wake up because I know now that that's not it's not that easy you know you can't have that outlook on somebody and saying I just want to shake you but I say this to people all the time that come to my group especially people who have family members who go through this family members feel a huge amount of responsibility so if do you ever hear people saying if they speak to a stranger mm. they find the helps mm. because as a family member having that responsibility you do just want to shake them you mm. want to just say come on like come on i need you here and mm. we're a family and we need to get through this and so yeah did you ever feel like that you wanted to abandon her um so i never felt like i wanted to abandon her obviously i felt a huge amount of responsibility um, but then there was times because as I said I got a job and Donna made so I got that job through living with my aunt so I would have when my mum was in hospital I would have went and lived with my aunt and Donna made for a couple, couple of months and then I got the job out there in the summer um, walking into Donna Maid shopping centre and obviously there was little aspects of me like, like there was periods so number of weeks where I would have been like a teenager mm. and enjoying myself mm. and having fun and yeah, I possibly could have been saying sometimes, you know, well, I don't want this responsibility, but no, I would have never abandoned her. You know, mm. she, she was my mother and I loved her. And you always went back. Of course, 100%, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I always went back, yeah. And then, was that the last attempt before, or? No, so there was a number of attempts. Um, so we lived on the seventh floor um, in the flats and... I'm sorry, I'm just closing my eyes because um, I can still see it as clear as day. I can still vision. So basically, um, they were balconies, long balconies, long concrete balconies. And uh, I could be just coming home from school or I could be just going out to the shop or something. And she'd literally just be lying along the top of the concrete balcony. You know, just kind of like mm. two arms over two legs over kind of just lying on the top almost rocking as if you know mm. if it was a gust of wind or if she had it you know that was if she was gone so mm. it, it was very very frightening um so there would have been a number of attempts of that that i would actually had to bear hook her put my arms right around her and literally drag her all my strength and my in off um in off the balcony from throwing herself over the balcony the neighbours not help you? Um, we would have had two neighbours that were good friends with my mum. Um, but like that, they were young ladies themselves. Like, mm. I think of myself now, I'm 23. So my mum was 23 when she died. So I have two young children now. And I think, obviously, I'm the type of person I would help anyone. But I also know that life gets in the way. I know that we all can't be everything for everyone. And we all can't. You know, and I'm not going to say that they didn't help us. They did help us, you know, but like that they would have been 
possibly walking at that stage and you know their own children getting their own children to school and um their own families but at that stage I don't no one gave us like real real help but there was friends that were there for yeah my mum had did did have friends that were there for but there was no sense of anybody coming in and saying like we're going to help you or we're going to put some sort of supports in or um no I didn't feel like we had any help I really didn't god Mm. Mm. I keep bringing it back to look at you now, like, you know what I mean? It's like... And did you shield your your younger sister then from a lot of the stuff that was happening? Yeah. Yeah, mm. so um, I would have felt an immense amount of responsibility to her, so she would have been living with our dad, so she didn't see or hear um, any of the suicide attempts. One attempt she would have seen, because my mum would have had us all in the flat at one stage during all of this... Um, my younger sister was still, ha- ha- my mum still had visitation rights to her. Okay. So the three of us would have been in my mum's company, obviously for visitation rights. So at one stage we were in our company and she had us all in a, in a circle in one of the bedrooms, you know, and she said to us, put your hand out. And we put our hand out and she placed tablets in all of our hands and said, like, we're all going to take these together and we're going to go together and everything's going to be okay. But obviously me being the eldest and just having probably more life experience than what I should have had, I just said, look, ma'am, this is wrong. Like, you, we, like we're not doing this. And managed to defuse the situation and take the tablets off or in camera. But there was a number of attempts, yeah. There was a number of attempts. Um, there was knives. There was, like that, the balcony incident a few times. There was... Was that the only time she tried to get you involved? Yeah. Yeah, but that's the, isn't that look at what we're seeing in the past few years? Isn't yeah. that just the reality of mental health? Yeah, and this is where I come at it from an empath, an empath, empathic. I'm sorry, I'm so um, that okay. kind of way and a compassionate kind of way, um, because I will say things like that, and people will look at me going, "Hold on a minute here, are you actually condoning what these women did?" So without saying a name, like that mm. woman, mm. whatever happened with her children, mm. um, and then for people to turn around and say, that's not mental health, I just think is completely wrong. Mm-hmm. Because for me, I'm not going to condone that type of behaviour, and I'm not going to say it's right. It's definitely not right. But for me, I see the way that quite could have possibly been us. And I know for a fact that my mum would have never... like. When she was in these manic episodes, when she'd kind of calmed down, I'd managed to calm her down and I'd talk her down, she would have had a lot of regret, a lot of remorse, a lot of anger for the way she went on. So I know that even when she did die by suicide, that if she had had the opportunity to be alive the next day, she would have regretted it. Mm. Um, and I know that, you know, speaking about what's going on lately and what's happening with, you know, surrounding mental health and stuff like that happening to children being, their lives being taken. Um, obviously, as I said, I'm not condoning it, but I do think, you know, mental health needs to be looked at in a totally different way in this country. Like, the way we're approaching it now as a society, it's just not working, you know? Um, like, why say that somebody is has mental health problems and they've done that to their children but not address the mental health problems do you know what I mean and like that similar story that I'm talking about I don't want to say names but that lady had cried out for help Mm. as well apparently Mm. so for me I just think there needs to be a big change um, in mental health in this country and the way we overall as a society view it Mm. so even I'd say to people in my group um died by suicide instead of committed suicide Mm -hmm. because it's like they've committed a crime Mm -hmm. and even with my mum like she died by suicide at like half five half six in the morning there was nobody around so she wasn't attention seeking because there was nobody to see it there was nobody around um you know if she was attention seeking she would have had to gain something from that Mm -hmm. and by ultimately dying she didn't gain anything from it because she wasn't allowed to feel anything that she was 
that they said she was attention seeking for. So I can't understand that. Um, and then also, like, as I said, when she died by suicide, they didn't even give her then the decency to say in the... We went to the coroner's court and they didn't even say, like, you know, Rachel Hall died by suicide. They said it was an accident. So for me, that was a, even further kick in the teeth. Is that a kick in the teeth? Yeah, it is a kick in the teeth because it's it's basically saying, like, <laughs> look, I don't know if it's going to make much of a difference, you know, but it's basically, you're still diminishing that person's views and that per- how that person has felt. You're, you're saying that, you know, she's by one saying she's attention seeking and then by saying that no she didn't actually mean to do what she done it was an accident that's a further kick in the teeth like you're saying just hold your hands up and say she was mentally ill and she needed help and she died by suicide ultimately because she didn't get the help like do you know what i'm saying are they still saying misadventure are they still saying that um yeah as far as i'm aware it's misadventure and like like an accident yeah so basically it's an accident. That was what my mum's death was put down as. Yeah. I'd love to know now whether they do put it down death by suicide. I'd love to yeah. know that. That's a question. That's that a I'm, good uh, yeah. question, actually, and I, mm. I must look into that myself. Let's see, yeah, yeah, if they do say that now. Because yeah. misadventure, what's misadventure? like? What? Uh, basically, that they weren't in the right mind frame and that they didn't intend to do it. And um, I suppose what I'm saying as well, there is an aspect of that when I'm turning around and saying, you know, if my mom had have been alive the next day that she may have regretted it. Mm. I get that. Mm. You know, so when they say misadventure, they mean the mind wasn't in the right place. And mm. I, I get that, I do. But, I mean, my mom had wrote a number of suicide notes. She, there was a number of attempts. She had expressed that she didn't want to be here. Um, so, you know, why say that somebody who dies in those circumstances, why label a suicide and mm. then when they die not turn around and say, well, you know, she died by suicide. Mm. I just don't get it. Tell me about the day she died. Um, so basically there was a number of attempts leading up to the months and weeks of it. Um, she was in hospital. They would have been sending her home taking her back that was going on for a number of months um, and then the day she died by suicide she left I think or did they send her home they sent her home in a taxi no so the day I think it was the day before she died by suicide they sent her home in a taxi to my aunt and basically us the family me nan me nanny's home um, and then she was manic and she ended up getting herself out to, I think it was Clontarf, somewhere in Clontarf. There's water in Clontarf. Yeah. yeah, so she went to the water in Clontarf and obviously she was trying to do whatever. So I got a phone call um, from the police saying, you need to come down to Clontarf Garda Station and pick up your mum. She's basically after being in the water. She's not in good, good health. And even now sitting back thinking like, I'm a 15 year old Love girl kid, why yeah. are you call like I know mm. I'm a, a daughter but they called me to come down and pick her up and um like at that stage I think the hospital was actually just fed up with yeah because Washed their hands were yeah because why couldn't they why didn't they ring the hospital why yeah. wasn't there an outreach team or someone to come to the police station mm. and pick her up and mm. bring her home bring her to the hospital and mm. instead of saying like you know here's a 15 year old girl is going to come and collect our mom and She's in after being in this situation, and we're just gonna send her home, and that's grand. Like you just, you just deal with it. Like and even the guards, they didn't. I don't want to slate the guards. You know, at the end of the day, the guards, um, that guard that I dealt with was nice, but I feel the guards as a whole may need to update training around mental health. Mm. Definitely, um, but like that, they're human too. They're only doing their jobs too. Um. You know, I know as individuals we all have responsibility, but as a society and as the leaders of our country, I think have a bigger responsibility to implement certain 
structures that surround mental health mm. and certain you know ways of dealing with people that are struggling and I just don't think as a country we're there yet no um but like that I don't want to come at anyone you know and say like they didn't do this and they didn't do that but for that so for that day um they said to pick her up so I was seeing a chap at that time um I was seeing him for probably up to a year um and he was very aware of the situation and um, basically just supporting me so he was driving we both drove in the car we went down to pick her up and um, we put her in the back of the car or no I got in the back of the car she was in the passenger seat with him and Phil Collins song came on you know that song True Colours mm. so she said will you hire that song for me and we, yeah we said you know we were just trying to calm her and mm. make you know anything you want ma'am mm. we're just trying to make you feel okay and um, so yeah we heard the song and um never forget it true that song phil collins true colors um so that was playing and she said i want that song at my funeral and i was saying please ma'am just please like just please just like we're not please don't talk about that i have you safe now we're gonna go home we're gonna get something to eat we're gonna chill out and um the chap that was actually with me at the time um he said look him he's just a lovely fella he just said to me kim i'm not gonna, i'm not gonna leave you like i can't leave you mm. you know I, I'm not going to leave you, like, so we went up to the flat, um, my flat on the seventh floor in Ballymoon, and uh, I suppose I've been back and forth with stuff in my head, you know, like, when she said in the car she wanted that our funeral, should I have brought her to that flat, and then I was saying to myself, well, like, I was 15 years of age at that stage, I had nowhere else to turn, I, you know, the hot, why didn't, as we said, the police take her to the hospital and, you know, but now I have no guilt whatsoever over it, but back then I would have said, like, along the years, because it's been now 16 years, throughout the years I would have questioned stuff like that, but at that stage I done what I had to do to survive, I done mm. what I thought was right, so we just wanted to get home, you know yourself, yeah. if, if you're ever going through a bad patch in your life, you just want to get home mm. and you want to get into your safe space and that's what we wanted to do, so we went home um, and we were in the flat and she basically we were up it was christmas time so it was um 24th of december three days before christmas and um the christmas tree was up i don't know how i managed to do that by the christmas mm-hmm. tree up with all of this going on and uh, i was just trying to you know bring a bit of positivity and say to her look ma'am the christmas tree is up and we're gonna have christmas and we have you home and you're safe now and i promise we're gonna have a lovely christmas and um as you said, you're like, you get that almost sense of trying to shake them, but you're trying to talk to them. You're trying to mm. say, like, come on, and we have all of this going for us. And um, So we would have stayed up, watched a bit of telly, and then she said, I'm just going to go in and lie down. And I said, are you sure, ma'am? And she said, yeah, no, I'm just going to go in and lie down. And But she was very firm, like, at that stage, and I thought, right, look, just don't, just don't be molly, don't be yeah. molly coddling her, yeah. don't be too much, Kim, don't mm. be on top of her, like, just... Give her a bit of space, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she said, I'm going in now to lie down and I'm going to, um, sh- like, incense and stuff. And just, I was like, lovely. So she's going to do a bit of self-care and light mm. incense and look after herself and lie down. And So I went into the bed where I tucked her in and uh, just gave her a kind of a kiss on the forehead. And I said, look, ma'am, we're just sitting in the sitting room watching the telly, you know, yourself. If you want anything, just drop in or mm. you want me to make you a cup of tea or whatever. Um so she would have got up and down, she smoked, she would have got up and down and had a couple of smokes. And like that then, myself and himself went into my bed, then we went into, bed, into mm. my bedroom and um, we used to say, right, we'll put our head down for a couple of hours because it was a very traumatic, we had yeah. a hectic day, like mm. going to a police station to collect my mum and when I collected her, like, she was in, like, she wasn't even in her own clothes, she was in a police kind of uniform and all, so it was very traumatic, mm. very hect- hectic day and we wanted a few hours sleep. So we went to sleep. But of course you did, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> of course you did. Don't ever, like, you know what I mean? You don't I need know. to justify that. I know, I know, I know. I know, and that's what happens, isn't it? Like, I think that, as I said to you, over the 16 years, that would have been, you go through all these different phases of um, grief, and there would have been a sense of guilt. Don't get me wrong, in those phases, there would have been, mm. like, is there anything else I could have done? You know, mm. now I'm healing. I've I've haven't fully healed. I'm I'm walking on myself. I walk on myself all the time. I don't think you'll ever heal mm. such a traumatic experience mm. experience like that. But 
I don't feel guilt, you know, um, because I know I was a child. I know mm. I was 15. I know I needed sleep. Mm. I know that, you know, it shouldn't have been my responsibility. Mm. But um, so like that, we went to bed for a couple of hours and um, we were asleep. And I just heard, um, I just heard a bang. So it was a large, like a big knock bang. And um, I jumped out of my sleep and I went, what was that? And the chap that I was seeing, he said to me, um, oh, it's okay, you'll be all right, go sleep. But it never registered with me what it could have been or that my mum had a, had been. Because at that stage, she was calm. She was completely calm. Mm. Um, She was in bed asleep. She was wrapped mm. in our blanket. She, I kissed her on the forehead. You know, she was settling down for a night of sleep. Mm. And I just never thought anything. It didn't register with me. So that bang was half six in the morning and that bang was my mum hitting the concrete from the seventh floor um, in the flats. But like that... Um, sorry. Take your time. Take your time. I'm sorry. Take your time. No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. I'm just getting flashbacks when I'm talking about it. Yeah. Um, Do you want some tissue? No. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that would be mascara all over me face. I'm okay. Thanks, you're so good. Thanks very much, Rebecca. You're so good. No, not at all. Take your time. <coughs> now, and someone said to me, take your time, because it's like as well, isn't it? You just... You just kind of rush your the way you're. It's, it's you feel natural just to keep talking about mm. it and just keep going and. You're doing so well. Um, Honestly, take your time. Do you want a cup of tea? No, <laughs> take us up. I'm used to drinking cold coffee with the kids. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, take your time. You're all right. You don't need to rush into this. Yeah. So that bang was. Um, Basically, my mum hitting the concrete from the seventh floor. And um, like I said, it didn't register with me. That was my mum. So it was about probably 40 minutes to an hour later, I was woke up. You know, so it's quite surreal. And it still, it was quite surreal. And it's still quite surreal when I think back to how it all happened and how I was woke up. Um, so I was basically woke up by a knock on my bedroom door by guards, a couple of guards. And they said, um, they came on over me like, and just kind of, you know, when you're waking someone up, you kind of shrug their shoulder. Mm. They just said, Kim, Kim, you need to wake up. And I said, what? What? Like, you know, you're waking up with guards standing over you saying, mm. what? what? What's going on? Um, but because all of these suicide attempts were normal to me, Mm. which I'm saying normal mm. there, that word normal. No, I know. It sh- they shouldn't have been normal no, to me, I but know. because it was my life and I had gotten used to them suicide attempts, I just thought, you know, she's okay, but she's after trying something again. Mm. So they were standing over the bed and they said, um, Kim, your mum has been in an accident. You need to get up. You need to get up and get dressed. And I went, okay. Look, but listen, look, look. I was trying to calm the situation down. They said, look, now, like, everything is okay. Just just get yourself dressed. Come on, Kim, just get yourself dressed. And I said, all oh, right, yeah, that's no problem. So I got myself dressed and uh, I kind of got a sense that they didn't know what to say to me. They just were saying, like, look, is there anywhere you can go? And I was saying, well, I don't, what's, like, what's gone on? Where am I meant to go? What what, what do I do? Like, um, and he said, like, is there anywhere we can take you? Um, anyone, you know, family. And I said, well, my grandmother lives down the road. I said, um, like, is everything all right? And they said, look, look, let's just get you down to your grandmother. We need to get you down to your grandmother. We need to get you down to your family. And, you know, you, you'll be all right now. Your mum's had to be in an accident. And I was like, okay. So at this stage, when they had awoken me, and I don't know whether it was done purposely, but I think I thank God that it did happen that way. Mm-hmm. Because if I, I reckon if I had awoke up 
and seeing her doing it or or woke up and seeing that mm-hmm. I quite possibly don't know what I would have done mm-hmm. you know um I don't I actually don't know what I would have done if I had seen her like you know um a neighbor when that they heard that bang a neighbor went heard it as well and a neighbor went down and try to obviously help her and resuscitate her and put a blanket over um and then the guards and the ambulance obviously came and the neighbour must have said, you know, she's kids or whatever and Kim quite possibly is in the flat. Um, see, we hadn't spoke to anyone that day or that evening when we came home, so nobody probably would have known I was in the flat. But, um, yeah, so, like, like, they brought me down the stairs then, brought me down to bring me to my grandmother's and it, she was gone, like, her body wasn't there. And, yeah, I don't know whether they were aware of like whether or I don't I actually don't know how I just thank God that I didn't see any of it yeah that, um, that's a yeah yeah because like I think it would have possibly affected me a lot worse in my life yeah. had I have seen a happen or had I have seen her in that yeah. way on the ground um but so I came down the stairs to go to my grandmother's and I remember the look on everyone's faces and they were just it was just there was just sorrow writ all over their faces and I just started to get a sense of wait hold on a minute here there's something seriously wrong here like something was going on and I don't think this is just an attempt like what is going on but I think at that stage they had realised right she's only 15 she needs an adult to be in our company mm. before we can actually mm. say what's going on so I came down the stairs and I looked down and where it happened, I seen there was like a builder's bill, but it was obviously just from a previous mm. someone, possibly because you know, yes, that's mm. years ago in the flats, people throw things out mm. the windows or whatever. So, it quite possibly being just that, but something in me was kept looking at it and saying, Something is wrong here, something's not right. It was the exact kind of area where it happened, um, where she landed when she fell. So, I was like, Something is not right here. Um, they brought me down to my grandmother's in the police car and they said to the chap now bear in mind the chap that was staying with me the, the chap I was seeing at the time the guy I was seeing at the time lovely guy he said to me like um, I'm going with you and, but he had to go to work mm-hmm. and I said to him now you go to work like you have to go to work because at this stage they still hadn't said to me mm-hmm. something had seriously happened to my mum so mm-hmm. we I thought my mum was still under the presumption my mum was still alive mm-hmm. So I was saying, right, you just go to walk or whatever. And he said, no, look, I'm going to go down. And I said, look, just go to walk. Like it's, it's, but it's mad even now that I think back of me telling him to go to walk. Mm-hmm. I was used as a child to living like this, mm-hmm. to these suicide attempts and to just having that whole mentality of you just get on with it. Mm-hmm. You just have to get up and get on with it. And that's just, nobody stopped and said to me, are you okay, Kim? Like it was just, yeah you'll just have to look after your mum and you'll just have to get up and get on with it. So I just said to him, no, you just go to work and I'll be grant. So they brought me into my grandmother's house, my nanny's house, and uh, they sat us down and they were kind of in and out of the house, in and out, in and out for a good 10 minutes. And I was saying, at this stage, nobody still had said anything to us. And I was saying, what the hell is going on here? Please, will someone tell us what's going on? And uh, they said... One of them came in, i never forget him. Uh, he just came in and he said, look, sit down there, Kim, he said. And he said, sit down, Anne, to me nanny. And he said, um, look, about Rachel. And I said, yeah. And he just came, never forget it, it's clear as day. He came right, kind of, eye contact, like, just right into me face. And he said, Kim, your mom is dead. And I went, What? I said, what, what, what do you mean my, ma, my mom's dead? What, what are you talking about? Like she's not, and I'll never forget it. I'll never, ever forget it as long as I live. The hell of my nanny. It was like, it was like a wolf howl, you know, that, that pain just coming from inside of her. She just howled so loud and I just, we just screamed. We were hysterical. We couldn't, couldn't understand what had gone on because the way they made it out and the way they just brought me down and, it was like she just, there was another attempt and she mm. was alive. Mm-hmm. You know, she was just hurt, but she was alive. Mm. 
So, um, yeah, so they said, your mum's dead. And I knew, I knew straight away. I said, she did it, didn't she? She did, she did it, like, I, I wasn't, and I did, I... I did, I went through a phase where I blamed myself as well and said, like, it was my fault, you know. I wasn't, I wasn't awake. It was my fault I went to sleep. <laughs> um, and for a long time I suffered with uh, bad nightmares and sleeping. You know, like I couldn't sleep properly. I'd wake myself in the night and I'd sleepwalk and very, very traumatic, bad nightmares. And all of the nightmares were that... Um, most of them were the, I brought her back to life, you know, like she, she didn't die and uh, I don't know whether that was because of the way they handled it, the way they made me, not made me believe, but the way they, I thought, they, I just thought she had an accident, I thought she just mm-hmm. got hurt, I didn't realise she died, like, um, so yeah, for a long time I suffered with sleep and nightmares, uh, sleepwalking and then guilt, so it was almost like, if you go to sleep, something bad is going to happen. Because I was asleep when it happened. Yeah. I get that. Like, I get that. It's the trauma that you had with it. Mm. So what happened next then? Um. So, the family then were notified. My mum's sisters and... Um, my mum's eldest sister, she had to go and identify her. Um, and then, actually, I actually, um, I don't know whether it was being a hormonal teenager or whether it was just, I had just had enough of everything that went on. There was a clinic in Ballymoon, the old clinic in Ballymoon, a lot of people from Ballymoon would remember. Um, well, everybody... Anybody that knows Ballymoon would remember. It's like a grey concrete square building. So that's where the psychiatric teams, well, call it team, but that's where the psychiatric services were in the old clinic. And um, straight after it happened, I went up. I'm laughing about it now. Like, I'm not laughing, but I'm just thinking of Mm. myself, like Mm. an angry 15-year-old girl who has completely felt our mother has completely been done by, wrong by. Um, And, look, I'm not saying that everybody is to blame, and that's where I come from now, with, you know, looking at all different aspects of mental health and how to kind of approach the situation. I'm not saying that any one particular person or one particular service is to blame, but the way they handled it and the way... They said she was attention seeking and sent her home from hospitals and all. It was just wrong, and even down to a fifteen-year-old being left to care for mm-hmm. was wrong. So, um, I went. I marched straight up the road to the clinic on my own, and I banged on the door of the psychiatric unit, and I said, "Um, what the, the the clinic where they sat?" And I said, "Um, I said I want to speak to you." As I said, open the door, and they wouldn't open the door to me. I don't know. No. And I said, I want to speak to you. As I said, open the door. I said, F. And I was probably effing and blinding and screaming mm-hmm. everywhere. Very emotional and very hot and angry. And um, now I wouldn't have never been violent. Mm. Gee, violent. That's, it's not in me to be like that. But I just was very angry and screaming and said, um, you know, um, what do you, like, my mum's attention seeking. Is she attention seeking now? And she's killed herself at half six in the morning. She's jumped off the flats in Ballymun. And there was nobody watching. I was screaming and shouting. There was nobody watching to watch her, to give her any attention. You know, that sense of hurt and anger in me, I was screaming, but they didn't even give me the time of day. They didn't even come out and say to me, like, we're sorry. And and you could have done that to yourself then? Yeah. And they still didn't come out to you? No. No. No, it was like they were hiding away and they didn't come out and say to me, can you come in and we'll sit down and we'll talk yeah. to you and, you know, are yeah. you okay? And No, I never got, are you okay? Never. Um, I was just left then to go about my life. Yeah. Where did your life take you then? Um, so, I then obviously went back to my grandmother's. Um, I would have been staying around with aunts. My mum has a number of sisters. Um but like that, 
nowhere ever really felt like home. Um, because they were just trying to do their best and they had their mm. own children. And um, like at that stage, I, I was 15 and, you know, I wasn't in any way like a bad 15 year old. I was still walking, I was still in school. I was then gone. I was torn, that happened in December. I was turned 16 in the February. Um, so I was going in to do my leaving cert and all, like, and I done my leaving cert, you know. Um, God, Kim. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't go down the wrong road or mm. have any sort of anger towards anyone or, you know, I just, I suppose, done what was expected of me at that age, you know. Mm. I was expected, to, I was to sit me leaving cert and I sat me leaving cert and carried on with my part-time job. And How did you do that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, that, like, I'm, we're saying, like, now that you didn't want to break that cycle with your children, right? Yeah. And obviously, you're an older woman. You were, like, 16 years of age. Yeah. And you knew then yeah. that you weren't going to let this happen oh, yeah. to you. You knew then. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I knew then, yeah. Yeah. No, I was determined. And I think why I was determined was because the anger, like, I think... You know, you can have anger inside you about certain things that happen in your life, but it's how you choose to use that anger to drive you on. Um, and that's not me sitting here saying, oh, I'm this and I'm that. I mean, at the end of the day, my life is not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, Doesn't matter. No, I know. Doesn't matter. I, I know, and I appreciate you saying mm. that. I really do. But just to turn around and say, like, you know, if that has happened to someone and that their anger has taken them down the wrong road of, you know, drugs or alcoholism or any sort of way, not to feel that, you know, that you can't come back from that. Mm. Just because I didn't take that road and I chose to use my anger to drive on and do me leaving cert and get a job. And um, I suppose it was a sense of, as well, growing up with a single mother. Um, we always had that kind of stigma as well of, you know, oh, you know, well, did it come from a broken home and... They're never going to amount to nothing in life and um, mm. they're going to, you know, they don't have this and they don't have that and materialistic things like, um, and I suppose I always said, and then even down to the fact of them saying she was attention seeking, I was a real hold on a minute here. Mm. Like, so the anger just drove me on even more to say, well, I'm going to make you proud, ma'am. I'm mm. going to try and keep going and just try and make a, something positive of me, of me life and mm. not let them kind of... And I suppose that's where uh, I started wearing makeup as well from a young age, from 15 and 16. So that was like me little thing. Because um, it's gas. People will say to me now, you know, about their teenagers and I wear makeup and I'm, I'm like... I'm not advocating makeup for anyone mm. around, but I'd say like, ah, leave them alone. Mm. You know, because that was my little... It was me little mask. It was me mm. little, you know, I'm hurting inside. All of this pain I, I'm carrying inside and all of this stuff that I've gone through. But I'll put my face on and I'll face the world, you know, and I'll keep going. And is that important to you? Makeup is not important to me now. Um, but as a young 15, 16 year old, yeah, I had nothing else. You know, I hadn't got... Um, my father wasn't around. I hadn't got, like, much support. Um I I just felt like that was something I could control, you know. Mm. I can make myself look a certain way and I can face the world and I can keep going and I can be strong. Mm. But now, no, it's not important to me. Now I'm very, very comfortable in myself and uh, like that, I have done a lot of inner work. So I always say, you know, go within and heal. And So I've done a lot of inner work where, you know, I kind of say to people now, just take me at face value and um mm. back then being that young girl where I felt like I was being judged because I felt like people and it would have been said to me in you know ways where you know ah oh, the poor girl and she's no father and her mother's at to dying by suicide and how is she going to cope and what's she going to do and so now I'm quite comfortable in who I am as a person that I just think isn't it mad they'll say that yeah but they won't give you help yeah, 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 very true. It's like, say that, but why not say, 
that poor girl's going, what can I do? Yeah. What, how can I help that girl? How can I help? But it's not, it's, it's judgment yeah. instead. Yes, definitely, 100%. Definitely. Yeah. So that's why, like, when I do walk and talk and... You'll see me saying things like on before post. we start yeah. about walk and talk. Right? <laughs> Tell me, you're going. When did you settle? When did you did you start to settle into your life? Um, is that the wrong term to use? No, no. I get, I get, I get what you're saying, and I don't think that any of us ever really do settle. But I get, I get where you're coming from. So when did I go from the anger to trying to just calm it and? you know mm. looking at it from a different perspective mm. and letting yeah. go of any of the guilt and yeah, yeah i get that so i suppose just with time and growth mm. um so like i done i did um so as f- on for me leaving search i then went on i was part-time in the army you know like the reserve defense mm. forces so that gave me a lot of focus mm. and drive and um allowed me to as well put some of my anger into firing guns <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm not mm-hmm. promoting that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it gave me a lot of life skill, skills and um you know and friendships and there was people that would have guided me as well and that um so, did you find family there yeah yeah definitely uh, i found family there and then i went to college i did um sports level management in college i found good friends do and family do that um yeah I tr- kind of threw myself into different things like that um and then I went on to walk so I was walking while I was in college but me being um the young girl with no father and no mother I then had to go and walk a full-time job rather than trying to go after me me dreams that mm-hmm. I had studied in college for because at that time money mm-hmm. I needed money mm-hmm. You know, I needed money to survive. So it was like, look, your goals and dreams or whatever you have, take a backbone, you need to survive now. Mm. So I worked full time in a job. Um, I met my children's father and we like lived 15 years. We worked together and we done a lot of a lot of growth together. Um, during that as well, while I, when I met him, I did. Um, oh, sorry. While I was with him, I did. A beauty course mm. so I then did a two-year beauty course and I found that that calmed me a lot as well okay. because we did um you know massage mm. and it was going from being that kind of rough tomboy in the you know the army and the sports to now you know softening it a mm. little bit mm. and going into the beauty and doing makeup and doing like all these lovely things that make you feel great and all so yeah that softened me big time Mm -hmm. um so growth I think definitely like over the years like I haven't just settled or lost that anger straight away it's it's been a process um counseling counseling yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) um I haven't been 100% honest which I haven't done a lot of counseling um I kind of just I always had that mentality of just, I don't know, as you said, like, how did you, you just, I don't know. I, I think I'm very resi- resilient because mm. of my childhood, mm. you know, like, as I said, I was in a care home at two and um, loads of different things I could tell you, like, that just made me resilient. So mm. I bounced back, usually bounced back quite quick mm. from stuff. Um, so I just kind of muddled along and just got on with it. Um, but yeah, I did therapy with a really nice man that said to me you're going to break this generational cycle um the beach I absolutely love the beach the beach is my happy place um so I meditate on the beach and I do sea swims Mm -hmm. so it's just to you know like open your awareness open you know your consciousness um ground and I use the sand to ground me just to get sink my feet into that sand and I use gratitude I practice gratitude every morning just to say you know you could be worse Kim what are you grateful for I'm grateful for my children um I wake up every morning and say I'm just grateful to be alive so when I open my eyes obviously we all have you know stresses in life we all have jobs we've children uh we've bills we've responsibilities so most of us wake up in the mornings with 
a negative thought. So it's either, well, depending on the day and the mm. mood. So some days you could have, you know, stuff you're really looking forward to and you could mm. just bounce out of bed. Mm. But most of us would kind of, you know, oh, I have to go to work mm. or I have to go to college or I have to do stuff for the children or I have, you know, mm. we're human, we're not robots mm. and we're entitled to have these feelings. But I practice gratitude every morning and flip them feelings and say to myself, do you know what, Kim? You woke up. You know, you're alive. Um, I believe in God and I'd never force... I was going to ask you, <laughs> yeah. do you believe in God? <laughs> yeah, I believe in God. Um, I'd never force my beliefs or opinions onto anybody. But um, definitely 100% believe in God. I believe I'm being guided. Um, <laughs> people probably say, what the hell? But no, I do 100% believe I'm being guided. Mm. Um, I would have never been a big spiritual person. So mm. if you had said to me three years ago, like... Yeah, I would. I believe in God, but I would have just said, "Are you okay?" And like, mm. yeah, no, I'm just relaxed. But well, mm. now I'm going really big into my spirituality. Um, I feel I'm being guided, and it look. I just, I just feel it's all love, and I'm not going to. I'm gonna have open arms to that, and I'm not gonna close it off. I'm gonna. Like you've been. It's weird because, like, I everyone knows that I believe in God too. Um, that it's like you've and I, I'm always very careful when I talk about God and I don't talk about it too much because Paul kills me as I've always <laughs> said um it's like we were put here mm. to do something mm-hmm. you went through a, a very hor- horrific journey compared to me but also at the same time I feel that both of us were put here to do something and I'm not being big headed with that like I always knew I always knew that I had to do something and you probably yeah have now maybe not always knew but realized yeah. that you have to do something and maybe that for you, for me it's the podcast I think, but for you it's Walk and Talk. Yeah. So do you want to tell me about Walk and Talk? Yeah, so just uh, to kind of, I 100% agree with what you've just said there and like that, um, one of the things I say to people in Walk and Talk, um, you know, what you just said there, you believe we're all put here to do something and I 100% believe that. And I believe I turn around and I say to people all the time, when you think about it, like your fingerprint, this is how unique you are. Mm. Not even your children share the same fingerprint as you. You know, that's... Wow. Do you know what I mean? Wow. That's how unique mm. you are. Like, mm. And I always think we are 100% definitely put here for a purpose. Um, for me, at the moment, I believe that God is working within me. Now, people might sit and say, what the hell? Is she? She's gone fully into beliefs. But... Like, and if, if you had said this to me three years ago, I would have said, ah, here, come on now. Mm. But I don't know what it is or what's going on, but I'm getting all of these guides and all of these feelings, and it's like I'm on the right path. Now, that's not to say that my life is amazing or my mm. life is perfect, you know, because that's not the way God works. Mm-hmm. Um, there will be trials and tribulations still to come in my life. Mm. Um, but what I'm doing now um, at Walk and Talk, so basically... From the beginning, tell yeah. me about it. Okay, sorry, I know I can round. No, you're not. You're not. You know, I just want because yeah. walk and talk is so important. Yeah, and it's helping so many, and it it the opportunity to help so many more. So from the beginning, tell me what you started. Okay, with. okay. So basically, obviously, stemming from the anger that what went on with my mother over the years, and the fact of you know, I just think that. For a doctor to say my mother was attention seeking and for the services not to be there when she needed the most, um, I just felt like, what the hell? Like The services in this country are just diabolical for mental mm. health. So what would have happened then as well over the years was because of the then growing into, you know, being more empathy, more, having more empathy. I struggle with that word. I having know, more empathy. Or, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm just saying this, don't we? But... But having more empathy and compassion and love that, um, like, I feel, I'm after going off what I forget to say now. But I swear to God, this is how much I ramble on and the coffee doesn't help. You're you know fine. <laughs> no. So this is what you've gone through in your life. Yeah. Um, has the, the realisation in you that you have lots of empathy yeah. and resilience that you can put that to good use. Yeah, basically, that's what I'm trying to say. And, um... So, like, I had this in my head for a number of years. I was angry. So the mental health services aren't up to scratch. And because I ha- have found out that all of that happened, people started to come to me then and open up to me. 
So, like, I could be anywhere and someone would open up to me and I'm saying, what the hell is going on here? Like, you know, I wouldn't... Because mm. I'm the type of person... Um, so, basically, you could say to me, right, I'm Rebecca and blah, 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 blah. But I will listen to you. I'll 100% listen to you. I'll, I'll listen, like, you know, so much and I'll, give like, be talking to you and be compassionate and show you love. But I do not want your information to do anything bad with that. Mm. So I don't gossip, so to say, and I wouldn't be drawing information from you. So, like, I'm when people are telling me things, I'm going, I'm not the type of person that would go up and say to someone, oh, how are you, and how did you get on, and what did you do? And mm. don't get me wrong, I'll take an interest in people's lives, and mm. I'll be very polite to them, mm. but I wouldn't be going up going, and what did you buy last week, and what did you do, mm. this and that. Mm. I, I don't... I just don't want to take anyone's... Like a soundboard. Like, let them say it. And if they need to say it another time, you say it. But it's like... Yeah. That way. No, yeah. Like, I... And, and I, it does... I do take it on and it does yeah. affect me. Mm. And I do have, as I say, lots of compassion. But no, like, I wouldn't go to people looking for information from yeah. them. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. sometimes, like, I could probably possibly look quite closed off because of the fact that I wouldn't be trying to draw information mm. from people. Mm. But then when they actually sit and talk to me, they it's it's like, yeah, they just feel like they they can say it to me and I listen um, to them. And I don't know why, but it's, it happened to me a lot over the years anyways that people would come to me and talk to me and then people then started, you know, when they were really in dire straits, ringing me and, um, you know, I'd go and pick them up and drop people to A&E or just try to help mm. them with their mental mm. health on a kind of just a... A sense that you know I'm not qualified as a counselor. I'm mm. not qualified, you know, mm. in that stuff. So I can just be a friend and listen and mm. try to guide you as best I can mm. from life experience. Mm. So that was happening. And but while that was happening, I was noticing that the services were absolutely shocking in this country. Mm. Shocking, like there was no help. Mm. So if I brought a vulnerable person to A and E, they're left sitting for hours in A and E, and you're sitting and saying to yourself. How can this be? Like, mm. how can somebody who is completely, like, in dire straits in their mind, like, they mm. are just, you know, you can't, you're trying to calm them, you're trying to give them some sort of hope. Mm. Um, like, and me as one person then at that stage, you're going, right, I, I need someone else to help me yeah. here as well. And also, as well, if you think about it, I get a lot of people that... Um, I wouldn't necessarily know them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So mm. I'm going then into a situation where I don't know their family. I don't mm. know their background. Mm. I don't know their circumstances. So I'm just trying to do what I need to do to get them safe mm. in that given time. So when I get them safe and I'm sitting in A&E and I'm going, hold on a minute here. What the hell is going on? Like mm. they're leaving this person who I have said is not in a good mind frame. Mm. They're just leaving them to sit in an A&E on their own. And like, what do we do here? There has to be another conclusion like there mm. has to be something else that there just has to be like as a society as people like you know just having that bit of compassion there has mm. to be something else we can do like we can't mm. just leave people sitting in A&E or just like what happened my mum well just just go on just go home mm. like your attention seeking you know so I always found that there wasn't enough um help for anyone that I tried to help and then if there was help it wasn't the help that I mm. feel was right. Mm. And then there was no uh, really big emphasis on aftercare. Mm. So I then said to myself, look, um, I'm not the great messiah. I don't claim I am. I'm not going to be able to go out and fix people. Mm. I don't claim that. But I just thought, Do you know what? I cannot sit back and watch this anymore. I just can't. And I'm not mm. saying I'm going to go out and change the whole of Ireland. I'm not mm. saying that. I'm just saying I can't sit back and watch people suffer and pain anymore. Um, and so I came up with the concept of walk and talk. So your first day, what did you do? Uh, the first day. So basically, I had this idea in my head that I was... The reason behind doing it was because of all of that stuff, saying that there was no help. And then I would have seen my mum in bed um, suffering from depression. And I just said, do you know what? My mum, we grew up in an area like in Ballymun, as I said, single mother. We had no money. So she wouldn't have had the likes of whatever it is now for a therapy mm. session. You know, you could what, pay anything up to 80, 100 euro. She wouldn't have had that money for a therapy session. So I just said to myself, like, I wish that there was something for my mum that 
you know, or people just tried more. People just, mm. you know, knocked at the door. Come on, Rachel. Come mm. on, get up, get mm. out. We're going for coffee. Yeah. Come on, let's go now. You, you know, like I'm here. I'm mm. going to listen to you. And this is just a bad hour or a bad day. And but you, your your feelings are valid. And mm. let's just talk it out. And let's just, you know, look at it at, in a different perspective. Um, rather than just saying, no, you're attention seeking. Go on, mm. good luck. And mm. wash your hand. We'll wash our hands of you. So I then had that in my head that I was going to just, you know, Try and spread love, spread positivity, try and help people that are in pain and that we always use this term suffering in silence and it's okay not to be okay and that's what I just wanted to do. I wanted to get out and do that and I wanted to change the whole outlook and perspective around mental health in this country. So basically just got a school bag, <laughs> a couple of books um, that I had read and I had found helped me and... Mm. Um, Myself with all these ambitions, I had no idea what I was going to do or say. Mm. I just said, I just want to make people feel that they're not alone. Mm. I just want to make people feel that it's okay not to be okay. I want to break the stigma and I want to change just a lot around mental health in this country. So I'm just going for it. Mm. So I walked over with my school bag and no, I think, did I, I think I had, might have put it out there on a story just to say like I was going to meet people and I was going to set up this group and mm. I was going to you know try and do something about mental health so I got there and um two faces two lovely girls two faces approached me and I was real oh like mm-hmm. I thought I was just going to be on my own and mm-hmm. at that stage I didn't even care if it was going to be on my own yeah. because I exercise and that was my route anyways I usually walked that route with my mm. dog as well and I was like do you know what if people see me walking like yeah. I had it then in my head that I was just going to pop it up on um, a story and say, well, look, I, I was going to be 100% honest, even if I was mm. on my own. Yeah. Look, I'm on my own and yeah. just I'm still going to let you know that I'm still going to be here every Wednesday. Mm. So if you want to come for a quick chat, <coughs> I'll always be here and I listen. And that was just that. And mm. now two girls and we got walking. So uh, I knew the route because, as I said, I take the route. So mm-hmm. basically, we we meet at Costa in um, Northwood in Santry, so in Santry de Myers. Um, we take the route, so we come down by the new houses and we take the route down the back of Santry Park. But I don't know what it is about this route. I really don't. It's just I liken it to like it's like I don't know. It's like it's taking you on a journey. Okay. I don't know, and maybe that's probably me looking at it like because it's my thing, and mm. I love that route and what it's done for me. Yeah, but it was like, right, we're gonna break the stigma to mental health, but we have to get people there first. Mm. So we have to get people in this country to now start looking at mental health differently. We have mm. to get people to start talking differently about mental health, mm. and we also have to get people that are suffering in silence mm. to come out from the shadows. And we're not saying. I used like to say let's. Sh- I like to say let's shout about it. But mm. come on, like some people might not want yeah. to shout about it. Mm. So we have to get them from that journey of you know we have people that even sometimes they can't make it past the front door. Mm. So you have to get them past the front door to the walk and then through the walk. So I call the walk liken it to a roller coaster. Mm. I would say like look, you might not want to come here at first, and the walk might be bumpy like a roller coaster. But we'll get through it, we'll get through it together, we'll support one another, and then you'll thank yourself. You know that feeling mm. when you get off roller coaster, oh my god, I'm after doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like that then in the end, like, oh my god, I feel great after this, and this is walking, and I'm gonna keep doing this. And just have a coffee for us, like a little No, you know, it's just meet there and it's just walk. No. So we meet at Costa um at Northwood, and what I do is I'll say to people, um, so my concept is we go in pairs. Mm. So uh, one is the talker, one is the listener. So basically, for the first half of the walk, um, you know, let someone talk and listen attentively, I always mm. say. So, like, you know, we obviously, as humans, we all would touch on gossip and, mm. you know, it just, mm. life is busy. So we just, mm. ah, how are you? How are mm. you? Mm. And how, what did you do? And so I say to people, look, don't be ashamed to say, now, I'm not forcing anyone into mm. it. Say what you want, because mm. I don't have the time to... Not that I don't have the time, but I'm jumping between people. Mm. So I wouldn't be focusing on one person saying, now, you need to say this. It's not mm. like that. I just say to people, look, just say what you feel necessary. And mm. just know that someone is listening to you. Someone is yeah. listening to you attentively. And um, so basically then, they people open up. So 
Sometimes they may, depending on the day, depending on the mood, depending on what's gone on in the week, mm. they may just touch on gossip or other times they get deeper and it's like a therapy session. So mm. some people would go into past. Um, obviously, it's confidential, so mm. I can't say what. Of course, said, of course. Th- some people go into past, some people go into present, some people go into anxiety about the future. Mm. Um, but it's then what we do is the tips and the tools we give each other and the sense of just listening. Mm-hmm. Just, and then just I say to people, like it gets heavy carrying that stuff on your own. You know, carrying mm-hmm. it sitting on your chest. And um, sometimes as well, if you just, do you ever say, like, see like as well, we use journaling as well mm-hmm. as another form of therapy. So you're getting it, you're getting it down onto paper. Mm-hmm. So it's coming from your mind, your own thoughts, and you're not stuck in your own thoughts and you're getting it down onto paper. But this is like, you're going out and you're talking to someone and you're saying like, Right, I feel better. Or even like we have people now that someone will say something. So last week, someone told their story. Mm. Um, Because what happens is, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. You're good. What happens is, is when we get through the walk, one is the listener, one is the talker. We stop at a tree stump in the middle of the park. Okay. And like that, it's an opportunity for someone if they want to come up and, so to say, tell their story. Mm. Because... That's what happens as well. People have gone through so much things in their life. People carry pain. I believe most of us carry pain. Mm. Mm. I think that all of us will have gone through something in our lives that has hurt us, whether mm. it's on just depending on how deep, but we all carry mm. pain, I believe. Um, and, you know, it's given people an opportunity to get up and they don't have to, completely mm. don't have to. And it's, some stay, weeks I don't even know this is going to happen and someone will just automatically open up like a mm. book like an open book and just come up and talk Mm. so like last week as well someone just opened up and then like that without her now there was a girl who had went through a very very similar experience so there you go then them Mm. two came together for the second half of the walk Mm. and they completely supported one another and the look in that girl's face was just like i'm not alone it was just like, yes, I'm not alone in this pain. Now, obviously, they don't have the exact same experience. Yeah, of course. But I'm not alone in this pain, and someone else is going through this. And do you know what? I don't feel shame anymore yeah. now. I don't feel shame for feeling sad about this, because that girl's gone through mm-hmm. it, and she's talking to me, and we're supporting one another. And it's just lovely. It's just, it is, it really is a lovely experience. Where So, Costa, what day, and so on? Okay, so we meet every Wednesday... At 10 a.m., um, Costa Coffee in Northwood Santry. So it's the coffee shop in the middle of Santry, you know, mm-hmm. where the Gulliver's re- yeah. retailers. So we meet there every Wednesday at 10 a.m. The walk usually takes about an hour. Um, last week went on for an hour and a half. But like that, we then, it's optional then if you want to go for coffee after. Mm. Um, because bear in mind, when people open up, I like... To say, like, I like to make check in with everyone yeah, and make yeah, sure everyone's yeah, okay, yeah. um, offer them any sort of other support I can, mm-hmm. um, you know, and just we all we mind each other, yeah, because there's days where we could be walking, as I say, depending on the mood, depending on the day, depending on just depends. I like into a roller coaster, so it just mm. depends on the week, um, like last week we were giggling, but there was weeks where we were stopping and crying and mm. very emotional and hugging and. Um, but so you just say to anyone, anyone out there, just come out and join us. Yeah, everyone is welcome. Like mm. we don't discriminate against male, female. Mm. Um, you know, just obviously, um, sometimes as well, women bring their children mm. along. Um, but I mean, that's completely up to you. Like, if you feel like you're bringing your child and you feel like there's something that you don't want your child to hear, mm. well, number one, I'd say don't bring your child if you don't yeah. want your child to hear something. Yeah. But um, there's ways around that like I mean there's ladies that come with their children and they may just want you know a quick chat just to get out yeah. of the house yeah. so they'll just chat with somebody on a, with, that's going along with a child as well mm. that just wants to talk mm. about your normal everyday life they mm. don't want to get too deep Yeah, you know so we are quite aware about that as well um, but now literally I'm just saying like just just come out just, mm. and then I, I know I can't just sit and say just come out because as I said I'm very aware of people that suffer in silence I'm very aware that sometimes it's not just as easy for people and then I get messages from people that you know as well have social anxiety and mm. um, they don't like mixing in groups and you know it's I get all that completely get it I get messages from men that um 
say they want to come, but they mm. can't come because, you know, they feel there's a stigma towards men. Mm. And, um, like, suicide rates are actually higher in men than they are in women in Ireland. So I get that. Mm. You know, I get that men think that they can't talk and... Put that down. Sorry. It's going to rustle on your, on your mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, stop it. Put it down. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, I get it. I get mm. that, you know, because even when you're growing up and I would have heard things as well, like, around people that I would have grew up as well, you know, you would have man of the house. Or, mm. Mm. You know, men are always taught to be strong and mm-hmm. get up and be the man of the house and the woman, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I get that. I get yeah. where sometimes men just feel like, no, they have to be strong and they mm. can't open up. But um, they're welcome. Oh, yes, definitely. Mm. Men, women, um, all ages. Like, we mm. have young girls, we have girls my age, we have older women, we have older men. Like, you know, so honestly, mm. anyone is welcome. There's children that come, because, like, that the girls that have the children in school or whatever, but there's the weeks where life happens, you mm. know? And let's say, like, the, the crash closes for mm. a day or something. You know, there's girls that bring their children in the pram, and they just bring little snacks for the children, and... Uh, the, just what? the kids love being out in nature. Mm, yeah, do you know what I mean? So the kids are out in nature. They're seeing and everything. They're taking in that fresh air, and they're they're developing. The, it's developing the helping the children develop as well by, you know, seeing people smile and mm. looking at people's emotions and just being human and just you know sharing mm. love and sharing positivity like that. We do get deep, but it's not a sense of you know, oh, it's deep and everyone's sad. We kind of always try and I try to bring it back. So. Yeah. You know, if you are going into, let's not let's just. I always say to people as well. So I always say, look, have your emotions. Your feelings are valid. Your emotions are valid. Have your I call it a good cleanse. Mm. Like if you want to cry or mm. you want to get your feelings out there, but I always say, don't stay there. Mm. You know, bring yourself back. Have different tools and different things that bring your awareness back, and don't get stuck down the rabbit hole. And you know, bring put things in place that lift you back up. So that's what we do. We walk and we talk. And when we talk, we can get quite deep. But then we stop off in the middle as well. And there can be things that can bring you back. So last week we had a lovely poem. Lovely. There was a chap that I tagged on his story. Mm. Um, so he, I came across his book. And um, I tagged him because I read a poem last mm. week. So it's just... It, like, I don't have an actual script. Mm. You know, I have me little stop-off points and me mm. vision in my head and the listener and the talker and checking in on everyone and the compassion and the love and the positivity and me little bits and bobs and things I say and to practice gratitude. and But it depends on the week, as I say, and people's moods. Mm. I tend to go off feeling. Mm-hmm. So I can feel people's energy. So yep. I can feel when I'm walking if someone is not feeling it or mm. if someone is struggling with something. Yeah. So let's say I could have in my head, right, I'm going to plan on, on giving all these tips and tools or reading out this poetry, whatever. But then if I come across somebody that's struggling... That's out the window. Mm. That I have to just play it by ear. With yeah, you. I have mm. to, you know, yeah. see if that person is okay. And are you, there's demand date that you've been asked for other days. Are you going to yeah. to add on other days and stuff like yeah. that? <laughs> um, yeah, Jesus, I'd love to. Um, at the moment, I'm doing personal training as well. Mm. And like, I'm just trying to build that and mm. just trying to, um, you know, trying to manage everything. I have mm. two small children as well. So, and um, as I say, I always say they're my number one priority. Mm-hmm. So as long as they're in school and I can manage another day, then yeah, definitely. Where can people God. find the information about it? Uh, so and the personal training as well. Um, I at the moment I don't really advertise personal training, um, because I'm still in that process. Like I have a little small gym out the back, but mm. I'm still in that process of you know registering everything. Like I have mm. still registered, but. Do you know what? Sometimes I'm just so hard on myself. I really mm. am. I feel like I have to have everything. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> but um, yeah, like if people are interested in personal training, they can just message me. Yeah. Um, on, and the walk and talk. And the walk and talk uh, is the same. Just so, just on my Instagram page, on my Facebook page, my Instagram is at Fit with Kim Hall, um, and then I'm Kim Hall on Facebook. Like that, I don't have any separate page for walk and talk. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't been advertising it as you know there's a certain email or certain place yeah. that they can come other than just myself you know yeah. so it's my personal page um i fit with kim hall or 
Me. We'll tag it here in any way. So yeah. have all that. Yeah. Kim, tell me about um, the future. You're going to look at doing a degree, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So I have hopes, please God, um, to go back and do a degree in psychology. Um, mm. Like that, I always say, you know, because people have come and said to me, and they've been great. Like People have been encouraging me saying, you know, life experience triumphs any piece of paper, like any sort of degree. And I always say, yeah, I know, but... Again, I'm so hard on myself. Mm. But also, I just think that um, I just want to be able to give the best. And if I'm giving somebody ex- like stuff from life experience, I do want to be able to have knowledge as well mm. and to say, like, look, what I'm telling you or what I'm advising you is, is right. And mm. like, I'm not saying that it's going to be right for everyone, mm. but I just feel for myself, yeah. And I'm very, very intrigued mm. by the human mind, mm. very intrigued. Um, and the whole aspect of just, you know, behaviours and consciousness and awareness and just how the mind works. It absolutely, like, it just intrigues me so much. Of course. Yeah. 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 So they're gonna, you're going to look at other days of walk and talk. People yeah. can find you. I'm going to tag you here. Yeah. But on that note, Kim, we leave it there. Oh, <laughs> thanks very much. Rebecca. Thank you so much. Cheers. I know you are nervous coming in. And in the end, as I said, you know, you've been, you should be very proud of yourself because you've been so true to your story. And I'm delighted with Walk and Talk. And one day I might join, but then people probably think, oh, she's coming up for a podcast. So <laughs> I probably not. They probably wondered away when they see me. But um, no, but like really and truly well done and fair play to you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks very much for having me.